I've been hired by moms that are good with money. Not because they didn't know what to do, but they hired me because they wanted another trusted adult at the table. Their teenagers needed to hear it from somebody else. I want to give a quick shout out to my podcast manager, Abby. If you're in need of help in launching and managing your own show, please reach out to her at productions at abbyguaki.com. I'll put her details in the show notes. She really is the best and I love her. Hello and welcome back to the Quiet Wealth Podcast. I'm your host, Camilla, and I'm so excited about our guest we have today. But first, this is episode 99. Like, what a great number, right? Like 99 episodes that we put in putting out. So I'm super excited for episode 100. There's going to be a special surprise there. So make sure you tune in for episode 100. And if you are new here to Quiet Wealth, welcome. I'm always happy to welcome new friends here. We talk about three things. We talk about building wealth, building businesses, and leaving a legacy. So I want to have a special welcome to Colleen Salkow, who is here with us. She is a financial counselor who specializes in middle and high schoolers and with their parents teaching that next generation about all things money and finance. So Colleen, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I'm super excited to have you. So Colleen and I met at FinCon, which is a financial conference for money nerds. So Colleen and I are both money nerds. We like to talk about money and we like to educate about money and teach people all the things they need to know how to manage their money wisely. And I'm super excited to talk to her. So Colleen, first off, give us an overview of who you are and how you became a financial counselor for teenagers. Thank you so much for having me again. I really enjoy being on podcast. My story, I was teaching just south of Detroit from 2007 to 2011. So right as the recession was hitting the metro Detroit area in a very significant way. And I was working with families that had never applied for reduced lunch at the time. And I saw a need for having financial education in our schools. And then in 2011, I married my husband, who is an active duty Marine, and I moved to North Carolina. And we realized when we combined finances that we had $60,000 of debt, $9 in our checking account, and $100 in savings. And so I saw the need for financial discussions at my own kitchen table. That debt was overwhelming. It felt like a burden, but luckily we're able to work together and learn how to use a budget. And within two years, we paid off that debt. And from 2013 to 2021, we were debt-free until we bought our first house here in South Carolina. I saw that not only were families that I was working with as a teacher, but as a military spouse, as an active duty spouse, the importance of having these conversations and knowing where your money was when you needed it, especially when emergencies came up. So in 2019, I launched my own business. And because of my background in education and my master's in counseling, I saw the importance of starting these conversations about finances early on. So I created a program where the middle schoolers, mom or dad or grandparent, one of their mentors will hire me to work with their middle schooler, but I bring those those adults to the table so that the students and the families can learn how to talk about these topics together that have been taboo for so long. So I have a middle school program that I developed, and then I have a program for high schoolers and young adults that also brings their parents or mentors to the table. As an active duty military family, I've seen how beneficial mentors are in young adults' lives. And just because you may not be living at home anymore doesn't mean you don't need some kind of support, especially when you're learning how to track your finances for the first time and really understanding how to be intentional with your money. Because if you can learn how to track $100, it's going to be so much easier to track $1,000 or $10,000. As your income goes up, you'll have those habits already in place. 
This is awesome. I and, and I was so excited when I met you at FinCon because I was like, oh my gosh, yay, you're teaching kids because I have my own program that I that I teach kids. I developed a family bank system for my kids and that's something that I'm starting to teach other parents how to use. So that's interesting that you chose middle school first, right? You chose middle school first and that's who you were targeted. So why did you choose middle school? You know, it, it wasn't really even, they weren't the first ones that I that I mm. started working with. I did start working with high schoolers first, but when I taught in the Detroit area, I taught middle school. I was a sixth grade teacher. And so I knew what the expectations were when it came to math. And I'm like, well, if they can do that kind of math, if they can understand a percentage, they can start telling, you know, okay, I've earned this from babysitting or from mowing the lawn, whatever income they have coming in, even allowance. If they can sell this percentage I'm going to put into savings, this percentage I'm going to put to spending, then why not start it earlier? The earlier, the better. Again, it really comes down to those habits. And I mean, right now in our country, I think Forbes had a stat out this past March where it said people earning $100,000 a year or more, 50.2% of those individuals are living paycheck to paycheck, which shows that just because you are earning more money doesn't mean that automatically means that you know what to do with it. Yes, for sure. hundred percent, hundred percent. I think there's so many people that live paycheck to paycheck because they just don't understand the fundamentals. They don't understand how to really live below their means. They want to just increase their lifestyle and, and all of that that's happening. So let's talk about middle schoolers for a minute. What are the concepts that you start out with teaching middle schoolers? Yeah, with my middle school program, I really focus on how to earn money. Many of them don't have part-time jobs yet, especially depending on what state that they live in, but they still could use their time on the weekends to babysit. And we brainstorm ways to earn money. And then we also brainstorm ways, how are you going to use that money? Because a lot of the clients I've worked with in this age group, they're just fun. They come in with so many awesome questions. They're like, well, I want to go buy these Nike shoes. And mom and dad are like, you're in the middle of a growth spurt. I'm not going to spend that on Nike shoes. But if that middle schooler is focused on, okay, this is what I want. Okay, so what could you do? How could you earn the money to go buy those shoes. And then after they've bought the shoes, I encourage the parents after they've outgrown the shoes, that's a learning opportunity too, because then was that worth it? Was that purchase worth it? Which is another question we should be asking ourselves, even as adults, is it worth it? Is it worth going through the drive-through? Is it worth going and getting you know, more Halloween decorations? It's Halloween the day that we're recording this. And so like, is it worth it? Is all of these questions, these are part of those healthy financial habits that have empowered our family. And I've seen empowered young adults too. I love this brainstorming process. So I have five children. My youngest is now in middle school. I have one in high school, one in middle school, and then the other three have graduated already. But they've done all sorts of different jobs. And sometimes it was for others. I remember my oldest daughter, when she was 12, we made up a little flyer that said mother's helper, right? I wasn't, she wasn't quite ready to babysit full on, you know, but she could be a mother's helper, which was someone who came over and just played with the kids while the mom stayed at the house for safety reasons, you know, and then the mom could do whatever she wanted to do, but still was around. Right. Um, or you could go clean their house for them or you know, all sorts of things that you can do. And because when I was a young mother with multiple kids, I would have loved a 12 year old to knock on my door and say, Hey, do you need some help? Like, yes. Yeah. Yes, I do. Yes. <laughs> yes, I do. Can you go play with them in the yard? Can you just, go, yeah. can you go make a puzzle? Can you, can you like yes. jump on the tramp with them? Yes. <laughs> I'm yes, tired. I, I just need to get, well, it's not, it's not only, are you tired, but it's just like mom needs to just get the casserole in the oven and then mm-hmm. do a couple mm-hmm. other things. There's just, yeah, mom, mom. Yes. Yeah. Those, the mother's helper is actually one of the strategies I've also encouraged my middle schoolers. And I also encourage boys, like mm-hmm. boys are for a lot, a lot of them are like, I don't babysit. I'm not a girl. I'm like, are you kidding me? Some of my best babysitters <laughs> have been boys that are yes. just like, all right, let's go to the park and play. Yes. Yeah. Go yes. Play and play and play with them. <laughs> yes. And that also brings up a good question of like, is it worth it 
to be a mother's helper or you know how much are they being how much are they making compared to someone that's you know shoveling a sidewalk when this when there's a storm or raking leaves you know it really mm-hmm. starting to you know understand that your time your work your your work is valued I remember one time I was in middle school, we were watching a neighbor's pet during spring break and we got up and we let that dog out like three times a day. Like it was, you know, three or four times a day, took it for a walk and the the parents came back and they gave us t-shirts from where they went on spring break. And my dad was (laughs) like, wait, what, what did they do? And I'm like, we got t-shirts that said, you know, wherever they went in Florida. And my dad was like, yeah, we're not doing that again for them. Like that, they you we saved them so much money from boarding fees, and that's okay. So yeah. that's also a great opportunity to learn. Like, hey, you bring value. Yes, yes, for sure. We have a little mini farm that we live out in the country in Texas. We have pygmy goats and little mini pigs and like chickens and stuff. And so when we go on vacation, we need someone to take care of the animals. And we have a neighbor, a a middle school neighbor who comes over and does it for me. It's not very hard, right? It's not like a hard job. It takes her maybe 15, 20 minutes in the morning and 15, 20 minutes at night. We pay her 20 bucks a day. And so if we're gone for five days, she makes $100. And and that's easy money. (laughs) Like, that is, that's that's pretty amazing, right? Yes. If you and then if you calculate, I think one of the things also I've done with my kids is let's calculate your hourly rate here. You know, so she made she was twenty minutes, forty minutes, right? So she made twenty dollars in forty minutes. So then her hourly rate is something like twenty five dollars an hour, thirty dollars an hour, something like that, right? Yeah. Which is great money for, for a kid. middle schooler. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's really also like money. you value that because if she doesn't come, the animals, that's not good for the animals. No, no, no. I love my animals. They need to, they need their food. <laughs> Absolutely. So, yeah. so, okay. So middle schooler, you focus on ways to earn money. Mm-hmm. And then what do you do for spending and maybe saving or what concepts are you teaching? So that's where I, I love having parents or mentors at the table because we also can have, start to have these conversations. Okay. They're in middle school right now, but down the road, what is going on? Is there a 529 plan? Does it look like this student wants to go to college? Are they maybe thinking of, you know, going to community college, trade school? What is starting to like come down the, you know, not that far distant future, but really what is it going to be for your specific family's needs? And that's why I like working with these families one-on-one. So if we know that they're going to, this middle schooler is going to be responsible for paying for some portion of college, then this is really where we can start to be like, okay, that is coming up down the road. So your savings needs to start to be higher than most. Usually we look at their families. Do they tithe? Do they like to give to charity? If they do, how much? Is it 10%? Okay. You can start tithing as a middle schooler or giving to charity as a middle schooler. So there's 10%. That leaves you with 90%. So you know, do you want to say 50% goes into savings because eventually you're going to have to start paying for car insurance or school down the road? Okay, getting in the habit of putting 50% of that. So then you're left with 40% of spending on clothes or spending on going to the movies, whatever you're going to be responsible for buying. Then we start looking at those ratios and we can adjust that to regardless of what their situation is. And every family kind of thinks about it in a different way. And I think my family bank system for us, the system we have is, you know, 10% give, 10% long-term savings, meaning ones you can't touch until you're 18 and then 30% investing. So that's, you know, 50% right there. And then the Mm -hmm. other 50% is for them to spend. We worked on intentional spending and how we do that. So let's move on to your high schoolers. So what is different in terms terms of your financial teaching for high schools versus middle schoolers. So for high schoolers, we really start to look at, are you thinking about going to college? Okay. And if you are, why? We go through a whole series of about six different activities during our eight sessions of why are you looking at college? Why do you want to go to college? What do you want to do in college? What do you want to study? Why do you want to study? And then I have them also identify, let's say you want to go into education. How much is a teacher making their first year out of college? 
in your area. And that's where we can start using different websites and having them research it. And really, when you can start to see like, this is the goal and this is my why, when you can identify your why, why do you want to go to college? That's so empowering because there will be times when it's not easy to go to class. There will be so many times of like, I don't like the group I'm working with. Why am I doing this? But reminding yourself of that goal, the long-term goal of graduating so that you can go on to this career field or whatnot. We also start looking at their 529 plans or ESAs, whatever kind of college savings there are. And talking about, all right, if you are going to be responsible, this is what student loans are. These are the pros and cons of student loans. And then we also look at, again, how are you earning money? How are you using the money? How are you spending it, saving it, and developing those healthy habits of being intentional? Are most parents pushing college today? 2023 kids that you talk to, is college like a really high priority? Because I remember growing up, college was the ultimate priority. Like there was no other choice that you go to college, right? But I think there's a lot more choice today. So I'm curious how families are navigating those choices. The families I've been working with have college funds set aside, but they also Mm -hmm. are aware of options of what to do with those funds if there is money left over. And so the short answer is no, they're not pushing college. I think we have had an awakening as a country of as to like, is it for everybody? And also, Mm -hmm. do we need, should we be encouraging these 17, 18 year olds to take out student loans that are the size of mortgages? Yeah. (laughs) A lot of, I mean, when I went, when I was uh, going through my certification to become a financial counselor, I had to go back and document all this time that I have spent with clients and creating curriculum. And when I looked back at all those hours, I realized I've been hired by moms that are good with money. Like every one of these women have hired me, not because they didn't know what to do, but they hired me because they wanted a trusted adult, another trusted adult at the table. Their teenagers needed to hear it from somebody else. Yep. I was going to bring that up. (laughs) Yes. Like having that other voice makes a big difference. Because sometimes when it comes from mom, like, I mean, so, so me, right? I am highly educated. I am a professional investor. I know what I'm doing when it comes to money. And even sometimes with, with me, it's hard for me to hold my tongue when my kid wants to make a decision that I'm like a financial decision. I'm like, I don't, I don't like that. And then like, well, it's my money, mom. Why can't I just spend it how I want? And I'm like, well, because, you know, so, so there's lots of different conversations. Conversation show. It is nice to bring someone in who is like they automatically see you as an expert and someone they're going that's going to help them understand and navigate. And I love this concept of you're not just having calls with the teenager. Like I love that you're having calls with the teenager and the trusted adult, you know, the mentor in their life. That makes a big difference too, because then like the whole family is making the decisions together and hearing the same things, right? Right. Right. And hearing, you know, the and because especially as they get older, even I've worked with teenagers that were not in college, but had graduated high school, there are still so many financial decisions Mm -hmm. that usually have a pro and a con. Like you could do this, but here, these are the consequences. And Mm -hmm. having that understanding that if you can talk to your kids about sex, if you can talk to them about religion, you should also be able to talk to them about money. Because when you know where your money is and an emergency happens, it's less scary. If you, you know, driving to work and you run over a board with nails on it and you need four new tires, when you know where your money is, it's less stressful. And a lot of that is preparedness too, helping the kids understand that you need a emergency fund, even as a kid. It's like a healthy habit to get into of having this savings account that you never touch unless there is an emergency. And can I tell you a cute story? So we had our own financial emergency recently where my husband lost his job and he got laid off. Right. And so our family was, we were trying to figure things out and, and we sat the kids down and we said, Hey kids, just want to let you know that dad has been laid off of his job. So we need to make some different decisions with our money for a little while. So my youngest daughter that hit her 
hard. Like she was very stressed and worried about it. And I said, no, listen, I'm, we're still going to like support your athletics because we think that's important, but we may not go out to eat very much. Right. And, and we may not be going on vacations for a little while. You know, so things like that. And then literally the next day under my mouse pad in my office, I find a $20 bill that says, this is for you, mom. <laughs> I was like, Oh, so she went and got money out of her piggy bank to help us out, right? So, so it was very sweet um, that that she was like wanting to help, and then the fact that she had money to help—that's pretty cool. Another question I have for you: So, you said the majority of people who hire you are moms who are good with money. Do you think someone who's not good with money? So, maybe one of our listeners is thinking, "Well, I'm actually terrible." money, right? So, and I'm embarrassed about it. And that's probably why I need someone like Colleen to come in and help me. But I'm too embarrassed to like have her come and look at my finances because they might be a mess. What advice would you give that mom? It's okay. It's okay. Most of us have made, I have made financial mistakes. One of the activities I have both the middle schoolers and the high schoolers do is I have them go interview trusted adults about financial mistakes that they regret that they made as as teenagers and young adults and the financial decisions they are grateful that they made as teens and young adults. So we go through this whole exercise of, you know, first you need to ask people permission if it's okay to ask them financial questions because it has been, (laughs) yeah. I mean, you can't just like go to Thanksgiving dinner and be like, grandma, hey, what do you regret? Like, no, this is this is one of these conversations you need to make sure people feel comfortable talking about in the first place. And so if mom is feeling uncomfortable in the in the first place, that's okay. I talk openly about how stressful it was for us to have the debt of $60,000. But that's for her to st- be vulnerable and share that with her stu- with her children appropriately. I could be there to support that because every parent wants their kids to do better than they did. And so if this is one area that you want your kids to have a better foundation in this is a way to do it. And there are so, I think in 2023, there are so many resources. There's podcasts like this. When I talk to teenagers, they're like, oh yeah, I've seen people on TikTok. You know, Mm -hmm. the kids are learning about this. Even when you may not realize that they're learning about it, you want to be at the table. You want them to be learning about this from you and from people you trust. One of the things that I suggest to parents is I say, you know, let's not treat the phone as the enemy. Let's let's find like healthy ways that they can use their phone to learn. And so with my own children, I went out and I researched and I found 10 financial influencers on TikTok and Instagram and said, I want you guys to follow these ones. And so I had them pull up their phones and they follow all of them. And now they see their content, right? So they're getting these these little hits of money habits and and money lessons. And that's been super, super powerful. And and I follow them too, right? And so if I see one I like, I forward it to my kids. I like share it with my kids. It's like, hey, you should look at this one. And it's just another, it's an extra layer of communication between us, which I think is kind of a beautiful thing. I know, I know people gripe and moan about how in 2023 people don't communicate anymore. I feel like there's just lots of facets and levels to communication yes. and yeah. you have to embrace them all and yes. and and meet your kids where they are. For because sure. the, there are times where I feel like people are over communicating. <laughs> like there's times <laughs> where it's like, wow, yeah. okay. okay, that's too much. <laughs> that's too much. But I, I completely agree. You know, I, I was on a call last night and, you know, one of, the, one of the high schoolers was like, well, I follow some people on TikTok and I'm like, and you watch their videos. And he, he was like, yeah, I'm like, and that's telling the algorithm that you want to see more videos like that. Yes. yes. So I, that's a great strategy of have go mm-hmm. out and find the ones you want your kids to follow. Yes. Find the healthy influencers and get them going. It's fantastic. I love having lots of mini conversations with my own kids. And I think that's a great strategy to take when it comes to finances, because it's a lifelong habit, regardless of where you are, the age, your income, you need to know where your money is. And so by having those little mini conversations or activities, it's going to kind of build up their endurance 
to like, oh, this is just part of life. This is just how yeah. you should interact with your money on a regular basis. Yes, yes. And can you imagine those kids that you are helping today? They are going to be light years ahead of their young adult peers. It's pretty incredible to see and, and to hear the stories from my own daughter who's in college. And she comes to me, she's like, Mom, I have to help my friends with their money all the time because they just say they never have any money. <laughs> and so we sit down and we have to do spreadsheets. And I'm like, I'm so proud of you for helping. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes. That is a reoccurring theme when my clients do those interviews with their trusted with their trusted adults and family members about their regrets, but also what they're grateful they did. They I have them write all on the same sheet so they can start to see if there's any patterns. And the decisions that people are grateful that they made, it usually comes down to they either were tracking their money or they started putting money away for retirement at an early age. Those seem to be very common answers. And then when it comes to the mm-hmm. regrets, it, the, the other common answers or themes I see are, you know, I didn't know what a credit card was. I had no idea what this, what the loans meant, you know, and, and interest rates and everything. And so again, we take those answers as a great opportunity to, to have the discussions and learn yeah. from others' experiences. Yeah. So are there any like books that you would you recommend to for teenagers to read? One book that I I do like is called Taking Stock and it's called, oh. it's uh, a hospice doctor's advice on financial independence, building wealth and living a regret-free life. I find that a lot of times a lot of these financial books, personal financial books are like extremes. Like you, you know, beans and rice, rice and beans, you got to do this. And this book is about like, okay, there's got to be a balance. You know, Mm -hmm. you got to be able to like, yes, you want to save for retirement, but it's okay to go on your trip if you can afford to go on your trip. Yes. You know, and I, and that's what I really appreciate about, about that book. It's okay. Like it's, it's hopefully going to be a long life but you want to appreciate the season that you're in. So, you know, if you're in college and you've already paid the tuition and you want to maybe go on spring break to experience spring break, okay, let's figure out a way to save up for that opportunity because you're only in college one time, usually. Mm -hmm. Like, And it's this balance. Yeah. And that was my daughter's experience. Exactly. Cause she's like, mom, I've always wanted to go to Bali. And I said, well, now's the time to go before you have a, a full-time job. That's that, where you only have two weeks of vacation. She's like, I want to go to Bali for two months. And I'm like, go figure it out and go. And she did. And she did it all on her own, like paid, paid for the whole thing herself and figured out how to do it cheap, lived, went and lived in the hostels, met people from all over the world. It was just an incredible, incredible experience for her. So back to the book. So I have yeah. two that I really like. So one is called Launching Financial Grownups. And actually the woman who wrote it, she spoke at FinCon last year by Bobby Rebel. And so that's a good one. I like, and that one's pretty well balanced. And then a little bit more aggressive, exciting one is this one called First to a Million by Dan Sheeks. It's a teenager's guide to achieving financial independence. It's written really like in teenage style for for the kids. I like that one as well. So those are a couple of books and we can link to those in in the show notes. But I haven't read the one that you suggested. So yay, I'm excited. I always love to add to my book repertoire. Yes, I have that one and I have one more if we have time. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Always. Okay. We always it's, have time. For it books. is an older book. It is. It was print. Uh, let me see. I think it was like 2019, 2018 timeframe, but it's the graduate survival guide, the five mistakes you can't afford to make in college. Now I tell my mm-hmm. clients, I don't agree with everything in the book, but what I like about it is that it's a very, the, the way it's written, it's a quick read. And it's a conversation starter that you can have with your parents or with other trusted adults. Maybe, again, people that you see being successful with their money, or at least what appears to be successful. And we also talk about how you can't always judge a book by its cover. But, <laughs> yes. but okay, so like asking them, like, did, how did you, did you go to school? Did you take out loans? Like, did you ever use a credit card? If you did, how did you do that? Like, what? And this is a great starting point from it for the for those awesome. conversations. Awesome. Okay. 
we'll link to that one in the show notes as well and uh, make sure that you guys can get all the books. <laughs> That's how I do. I have a bad habit, not a bad habit. It's a good habit of buying books. I buy a lot of books. And so I have, I have my book budget where I, well, <laughs> as long them. as you've got the book and I budget, read my mom loves to read too, but she is a library fan. She has saved thousands of dollars because she'll go to the library. Like goes to the library. Yeah. Yes. You know, when my kids were growing up, we we were diligent librarians. Like every every week we go to the library and the kids would check out a ton of books. Now that they're older, we kind of live in a very remote city that doesn't have a library. We live in a teeny tiny town where there is, I guess there's a library, but it's really small. Also, I appreciate an audiobook more than I ever have. Oh uh, yeah. And that's where the library, the audio, the library, our library has an app that you can like get Mm -hmm. your audio books on. And that, that's been a game changer for me. Here's a pro tip for you parents. Whenever your guys are going on a family trip, pop in audio books about money, about learning. Like the kids may pretend they're not listening, Mm -hmm. but uh, they'll, they'll hear some stuff that they're like, Hmm, that's interesting. They might pick Uh, up on a few things. Yeah. yeah, They might pick up on some things unless they shove their AirPods in the whole time. (laughs) That happens too. (laughs) That happens too. Well, Colleen, thank you so very much. It was so fun to meet you at FinCon a couple of weeks ago. And I'm so glad that you've come on my podcast to provide this value for parents. I know that as parents, we weren't taught stuff growing up, or maybe we were taught a little bit, but not enough. And so we're always like, "Ah, I don't really know how to teach the next generation. I know what I did, but the next generation is growing up different. And so I love that you kind of provide this service. So if Thank our you. listener wants to get a hold of you, what's the best way to do that? Their best way to get a hold of me would be to go to my website, uh, www.selcocoaching.com. I'm sure you'll add that to the show notes. They can schedule a 15 minute phone call with me to see if my services line up with what they're looking for. Uh, they can find me on LinkedIn, on Instagram, and on Facebook, all under Selco okay. Coaching. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you so much to our listener for joining us today. We are so glad that you're here. Please remember to share this episode with someone that needs these words of encouragement and to be lifted up by what we've had today. So thanks so much for joining and bye for now.